and then Carla. Okay, so everybody welcome to this um, noontime um, briefing on the EPA methane rules. And um, as I, you know, uh, Kaylee and I planned this and with Odile, and so I'm Joan Brown. I'm the director of New Mexico and El Paso region interfaith power and light. And um, um, I'd like Odile and Kaylee just to introduce themselves as well. I'll go ahead and go first. Um, so I'm Kaylee Shoup, and I am a community organizer with Citizens Caring for the Future, and I'm based in Carlsbad, New Mexico, so the southeast corner, very close to West Texas. So my name is Odile Poirier. So I am a community organizer uh, with Interface Power and Light, but in El Paso, Texas. I'm living in El Paso, Texas. Oh, it's good to have everybody here today. And um, we have people from New Mexico, El Paso region. And we also have a couple sisters from my community, Marlis and Carol. So if you see some interesting faces from California and Minnesota, and they're on because um, we have a climate committee in my community. And um, I'm sort of coercing a few people to make the EPA public comments. <laughs> So that's why they're fun. But we want to just jump right in because we have a lot to cover and we do want to keep this just to half an hour as promised. So um, we called this because um, we thought you could be messengers as well to other people that maybe haven't signed up to uh, speak of this rule. Um, this is being recorded so you can share it, but it's to give the overview of what the environmental, uh, the EPA uh, proposed methane rules are to reduce um, emissions to help our climate and also to address the harm from health and the pollution from oil and natural gas industry. And this rule um, is really important and has a long history. I began working on these methane rules and probably Don, you started at the same time or earlier. I, I can't remember if it was 2013 or 2014. It was at the federal level because their methane um, is this pollution that comes out um, in the, the production in various ways of oil and gas and through venting, flaring, leaking, um, when they're setting up the, the rigs and I mean, all kinds of ways. So um, these rules began to be worked on many, many years ago. And there were some that were passed at the federal level. They're not as strong as what we need them to be now, but then they were basically undone because of the um, past administration um, be, uh, who came into office even though they were still supported widely. And, but anyway, so then the lesser, then, then the rules came back in, but they're not strong enough. So in a nutshell, the EPA is proposing some new rules and why these are important. The old rules were just for new, um, um, new wells and facilities. And these are for existing and new. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of existing uh, facilities and wells and so this is really an important rule um, because um, methane is the largest industrial source of um, highly potent climate pollutant and is responsible for one third of the current warming in climate from human activities. So this in our country, so that is major. So to address this will really help um, dramatically in a very quick um, term. The other thing is it has a lot of harmful pollutants and Kaylee's gonna to speak to some of that in just a minute, the frontline communities and uh, people of faith have an obligation to care for our brothers and sisters who are everywhere. So that is involved with the climate plus with those who are having health problems. So it's a moral and ethical responsibility. Um, the good thing about this rule too is that it has gained information from local governments, tribal nations, communities, and it has aspects where the tribal governments can also engage um, as appropriate in their particular area. So there's a, a large justice element um, to it also. So this proposed rule would go into effect um, in uh, 20, oh, no, no, in 20, by, by, well, totally by 2035, is that correct? Don, you can correct me, Don, you're the, you're the policy wonk on this one. Um, but anyway, um, it would be, that would be total uh, far ending. Um, the final rule will be published by the end of 2022. And just to let you know, this proposed rule does not include everything that needs to be included, 
So in the spring, if you like doing this, or even if you don't, you feel a moral responsibility to make comments again. I see Nick laughing. You're going to have an opportunity probably in the spring for a supplemental rule that's going to be addressing some other things like pipelines and um, some other areas that aren't included in this rule. So um, some of the highlights. Oh, I must say to this too. Some people say, well, we don't have any oil and gas in our state or we don't live by this. I mean, this is not a problem for me. Why should I even bother with this? And, and actually just that statistic that um, this is the, that this industry is the largest source of methane pollution affecting climate. And it accounts for approximately one third of the current warming from human activities in our country is a major, major reason because we're all supposed to be caring for our brothers and sisters and have a moral and ethical responsibility. So this is all of our problems. And I, I think at last time I you know, thought about it, I think everybody in this country uses oil and gas in some form, whether it's in cars or heating or what electricity, whatever form. So it is all of our responsibility to address this. So some of the benefits from this um, rule, and there are many, and um, Kaylee and I are gonna, and Odile are gonna send out you know, we have back sheets of information, but um, some people say, well, it's gonna cost too much. What are the finances? Well, actually they've, the EPA has figured out that um, nearly $4.5 billion in net climate benefits a year with a total net benefits valued at 48 to 49 billion from 2023 through 2035 is possible. And that even just increasing the recovery of this natural gas that is put into the atmosphere um, is valued at $690 million um, by 2030 alone. And otherwise that would not only go to waste, it would be causing health problems and increasing the problems with the, the climate. So there are those benefits. Um, just a brief, um, large overview, this, um, EPA rules would also address finding and repairing methane leaks from well sites and compressor stations. So some people, you know, we work with, they say, well, you know, this is fine to have these regulations, but nobody's monitoring this. Nobody's calling anybody to accountability. Well, there are elements in this rule that are going to be um, set forth to address that, not only finding, but also repairing and, and reporting. Um, for the companies is also there. And we can send you all this information. Um, and another element that's really important, and this is more in the weeds, is it'll help transition to a supposedly zero emitting technologies for pneumatic controllers. Pneumatic controllers is just a fancy name for um, the, um, the um, uh, mechanical elements that will uh, help address this. And its um, goal is to eliminate venting of associated gas from oil wells. So associated gas might be when they're, they're drilling a well or some other times um, or uh, flaring and, and that sort of thing. So those are kind of, um, you know, just a, a big overview. And again, we will send out to you some facts, some of these facts and talking points but um, I just wanted to say that um, briefly in your speaking um, and in the people you're gonna invite, it's community voices, it's people of faith. So what's most important is you can take a couple of important facts or um, asks, because we do need to ask that these rules be as strong as possible and stronger than what they put forth. But um, your story is what is important, your particular voice. And, and that's what is important because there are all kinds of technical people that are going to be addressing these things. The other thing to note also is that you can take your comments and it's always good to write them down. And, and you know, you'll have like five minutes to speak, but I always say two to three minutes and that's plenty. And if you have your comment written down, you can hit, I mean, you can um, speak the most significant things very quickly. Um, but those 
and used and adjusted to write letters to the editor in your local newspapers, which are really, really important as an action also. So I just want to put that out there. And I think Kaylee was going to drop into the chat um, the um, link that you need for signing up for the registration for the public comment as well. Um, I can chat it in the chat for you guys. Okay, great. Thanks, Kaylee. Which needs to happen like right away. The deadline is November 24th, but we got word today that the slots are filling up quickly, which is a good thing because at this point, there are only two days for comments. November 30th, which is Tuesday, and December 1st, which is Wednesday. But if they have more than 50 people extra that have signed up, they will open it to a third day on Wednesday. And that would be excellent news if that happened. So, um, I mean, on Thursday, yeah, Thursday, December 2nd as well. So you need to sign up right away. And, um, you know, depending upon where you live um, or the people that you're reaching out to, you can let, we're trying to keep track of people. So people of faith um, with IPL, let me know. Or um, Odile, you can get folks to let you know. And then Kaylee's gathering frontline community members. And then we're trying to keep track of everybody and keep a list. So with that, I just want Kaylee to, to talk as a frontline person and community member. And Nick is also down there too, but Kaylee is our wonderful organizer. And I do just want to say, if you're signing up to make public comment right now as we're having this meeting, please just drop your name in the chat and let us know. That's one of the easiest ways to go ahead and let us know that you do plan on making comment. So I just wanted to speak to what your comment can kind of be focused on as a frontline community member and some of the concerns the frontline community member. So along with methane, volatile organic compounds are also emitted. And this is a particular concern for those of us in frontline communities because these affect health, they're carcinogenic, they have a direct impact on air quality. So the air quality here in Eddy County and then also in Lee County, it is exceeding federal ambient air quality standards already, the ozone level. So we do not have very good air quality whatsoever. So, you know, mentioning the air quality that is already bad and the health impacts that we have because of that air quality is very effective. If you have, you know, any kind of personal story about someone that maybe lives near oil and gas sites and deals with things like asthma, headaches, different things like that, just any personal story that you may have is very, very effective. Something else that we're pushing for during this hearing is we want to have a ban on flaring. This is something that New Mexico and Colorado already have. Specifically in the Permian Basin, the fact that the federal government does not have a ban on flaring really affects us in New Mexico because we are so close to the Texas side of the Permian Basin. Emissions obviously don't know borders. So that's something to mention if you're a frontline community member, you know that New Mexico is doing its part, Texas isn't, that is having a direct impact on our health. Um, also, I'm trying to think, what else am I missing here? Um, with abandoned wells, if you are in a frontline community, abandoned wells, uh, low um, producing wells, something we're pushing for is regular inspections at those sites. And um, if you're in a frontline community, you know, you have an understanding how vast these oil fields really are and how hard it is to catch leaks, anything like that and hold polluters accountable. So that's why these routine inspections, even at sites that are, you know, low producing is so important. So that's something as a frontline community member that you really want to make sure that you're hitting on. Um, any other frontline community members, do you want to share your experience like giving public comments and things you've mentioned in the past, um, Don or Nick, anyone? Oh, Nick, are you, I think you're talking, but for some reason it seems to be. Well, I'm not sure that anything I've said so far has been very effective, so I'm not sure I would be a good one. Uh, Nick, that's not, absolutely not true. <laughs> so, Nick, we know that it's been effective because people comment on it later and invite you to speak and share your story. So, and, and Nick, uh, Nick is a Mennonite pastor in Carlsbad. And so, uh, Nick, just say how, you know, you've gotten used to doing this and it's, it, first it was 
yeah, I know you were really anxious about it, but just say what the experience is like of giving comment. Well, they're just people too that uh, hopefully are looking for information. I think one of the things that I find most pressing for me is the uh, kind of the theological reasons for doing this. That uh, even a lot of people who are not believers or uh, Christians or deists um, have that moral aspect. And I think that's an important thing that we should uh, be pushing. That this is a moral issue. It's not just an economic issue. It's a future looking thing. Uh, I think looking at the future is a real big issue here. So much of it is just the economics now and my rights, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, making sure that it's for the good of everybody. And Nick, that's an excellent point. And, you know, I have to say, you know, faith leaders that have done this um, here in, in our region in numerous times, their voices are, are heard and they're appreciated because they're not the usual talking points always. As Nick is saying, it's the ethical moral responsibility. So that's really quite important. Joan, can I try again? What, can you hear me or? You're great now. I can hear you. All right, I'm gonna go quickly. Uh, I began working in 2012 on, on the EPA issues, just mm -hmm. in a very broad brush. Um, we have a 33 wells within a mile of our house. And we have 122 wells on and right around our ranch. So, uh, Don, excuse me, Don, why don't you say where you live? Because people don't I'm know. Sorry. So, I live in Rio Riva County in Northwest New Mexico. We are more or less in the heart of the San Juan Basin, which then I always thought if you took the uh, methane hotspot, the Four Corners methane hotspot, we would be ground zero for that, basically where our ranch is. But really San Juan Basin and the whole area is ground zero for that. But I, I was just wanting to say that um, these impacts are very real and personal for those of us who live on uh, in the front line. And that mostly I'm thinking of my neighbors on the Navajo reservation. And I like to say, um, and we should be saying, we, we stand on Navajo lands, uh, which is not really remarkable uh, we're in the very near Corn Mountain, which is a significant uh, Navajo uh, site, uh, cultural site. But if we think about it, there's 30,000 wells in the San Juan Basin, and every single one of those wells stands on indigenous land. So when this is coming out, I, uh, to Nick's point, just kind of going backwards about something other than economic bottom dollar, uh, financial consequences. Think of the cultural loss. Think of the sacrifice that is is happening to get this, these resources out to enrich a few people and impoverish so so many others. So Joan, uh, just going from the top, sixty two percent of the methane in New Mexico comes from fossil fuels. So a third worldwide, but it is our serious responsibility here. So again, to Nick's point, morally. New Mexico is famous for our pollution, infamous for our pollution as methane polluters. The most potent greenhouse gas there is, is coming from here. Uh, the Four Corners hotspot didn't go away. It's just that the Permian hotspot got bigger. So if that's what you want to be famous for in the world, then by all means, uh, don't work hard to revise these EPA rules and at every chance you get, because uh, we're, we're not only um, con, you know, causing health issues as Kaylee was talking about, which I wanted to say uh, with, the, with the people in proximity to the wells, uh, we are endangering the world. We are creating, contributing to uh, climate change in a very bad way. Um, and I think that should be a battle call for all of us. Um, and finally, um, uh, to that point, Kaylee's point, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about 98% capture and the rule that we're getting here in New Mexico is we've got through OCD and we're waiting from NMED 
uh, Colorado has a rule. So we're, there's a lot of talk about 98% capture and that's kind of something to celebrate. But for me, uh, for people that live on the front line, and I know this is true in the Southeast where I did live for a while, you know, 100% of the methane that's leaked and vented winds up on our doorstep. I'm glad if we're able after time to capture 98%, but that doesn't help the frontline communities when they uh, reach an overall goal that is averaged and generalized and is also based on oil company reporting. So we don't have that uh, accuracy yet, but whatever amount they capture, 100% of what's released is released into the into the doorsteps and into the onto the doorsteps and into the faces of the people that Nick is talking about, of the people that I'm talking about, my neighbors uh, that wind up in these frontline communities. They're not building those wells and venting them at the country club. So I'll quit there. Thank you. And I'm, uh, I'll post my contacts in the chat. So anybody wants to talk more, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Thank you so much for inviting me to this. And and, and sister Joan and Kaylee, Nick, I, I watch what you're doing with so much admiration down there in the Southeast. Uh, our, our, our hats are off to you. Well, I tip my hat, but my camera's off. So anyway, that's a hat tip. Don, thanks so much. And uh, Don, uh, thanks for bringing up the, the whole environmental justice concern, which you know all of us need to bring up, but especially people of faith. Um, regarding the indigenous people that are affected, but also those vulnerable communities and those people who are um, workers and also are uh, more uh, vulnerable economically. So like in Southeast New Mexico, I think it's close to 40% of the folks there are um, you know, Hispanic or Latinx um, in a lot of new immigrants. So the environmental justice is also a part of this ethical moral perspective and that we need to care for our brothers and sisters and be in solidarity. And I think that's what, um, you know, uh, Don was talking about too and appreciate that great deal is this sense of solidarity that our voices need to be joined with those who are concerned about this in those regions because, you know, Don and Kaylee and Nick and others in those areas speak out but it's very dangerous to do that, actually. Um, and so um, we, we need to be in solidarity and putting this forth and speaking. So um, in terms of folks of faith, it's also important to just, um, you know, say, you know, what faith tradition you're from, or that you have this as an ethical moral concern, that climate change is the largest ethical moral concern of our time, that we need to care for the children. We have a responsibility for our common home, for our brothers and sisters, for environmental justice, for more vulnerable communities. Um, and those are some of the kind of talking points you can use and to share your own experience and your own beliefs and values. Um, and we're going to be sharing a talking points page. Carlos is going to send it out to everyone that registered. And um, it has talking points specific, it just has, you know, some basic facts, but then talking points that are specific to frontline communities. And then it also has a sample statement that is from a faith perspective and another one that is from more of a frontline community perspective as well. And I also, just so you can take a quick look at it right now, I'll also drop the link in the chat for that talking point sheet. But again, Carlos is going to send it out for everyone. And yeah, then I yeah. did get a message that the sign up for the EPA hearings wasn't working for a few of you. Has anyone else had that problem? If, when you try to go to the link to sign up, is it working? Uh, how many folks on the call have signed up to speak already? Okay. Awesome, Donna. Okay, great. Okay, and I have a running list and so does Kaylee. So others, it would be great to sign up again. And actually you could go right into the link right now and do it if you wanted to. Carol, uh, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the one that's having the trouble with the link. I'm, I'm trying to sign up, Joan. Did you oh, get okay. the second one to work, Carol? Um, that one it, also. 
it's 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 weird i'll i'll try it but it may knock me off this i'm on i'm on an ipad oh, so. uh, oh okay okay well okay. just 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 keep trying because um one of our other people had a problem and they thought it was their computer because finally they got in so there's probably some weird things going on <laughs> with all of that does anyone have any questions concerns anything along those lines Okay, so uh, just just John, uh, just yeah. a question. You talk uh, about you know the follow up on this uh, hearing on January, uh, February. Can you say a little more about this? It's uh, different things. It is. It's a different hearing. So what's going to happen? So this is the initial, and then they're having a supplemental um, hearing that's uh, going to be addressing things like abandoned and unplugged wells ways to improve performance and minimize malfunction with flares, uh, some things for pipelines. So those of you that have pipelines, like they have a process called pigging, which can release um, you know, pollution, uh, tank and truck loading operations, et cetera. So um, I would say not to worry about those right now and don't invite anybody because they're gonna get so confused, but we will send information out about that There'll be a second round of hearings for the public for that. Then both this first um, rules and the supplemental rules will be joined together by the EPA and be put forth by the end of 2022. So, um, so that's in a nutshell what, what that's about, but don't get confused by the supplemental rules. It's just to cover some of the things that are important that they didn't do in this first round is my understanding. Thank you, Jim. So um, can, every, can anybody who's on this call invite one other person at least to um, sign up or more people to sign up for this? Um, that would be excellent, excellent. Because we need to get as many people as possible um, from not just New Mexico, but around the country. And um, so just again, you can contact us if you're signing up so we can keep track. Sometimes there's problems or things people need to know. So we kind of troubleshoot. And that's one of the reasons we need to know. And I, I, I can tell you, I've done a lot of troubleshooting, especially during the New Mexico, the state um, rules that we had. It was, there were all kinds of technical glitches and stuff. So hopefully that's not gonna happen here. Or sometimes they may say, um, we're running fast, so if you signed up, you need to jump on right away, and um, it's just to get reminders or a text to somebody or something so that um, you can jump on. So those kind of things happen. And I believe Joan and I's contact info, well, I know it's on the Talking Points page, our phone number, and also our email addresses. They're both on there. So, and the, you'll get more facts on that too. And if you want more information, there's plenty out there and um, we can send you a lot more information. So just let us know if you um, really want that. But for us, really what they want is public voices, our comments, your stories, your personal voice, why this is really, really important to you. People have done different things in the past, even they may have had a grandchild or a child even speak to this because they're concerned about climate change. Or Don was real creative. You went out into your, in your oil field in your ranch and spoke. And that was, that was good. So um, you can be creative with this too. I think it, it just makes it more human. As Nick said, these are just people. And so we just need to talk to them as people, as brothers and sisters from heart to heart and with those kind of concerns. So if there's nothing else, um, we will hold to our promise. And this is, um, so I, we hope this has been helpful in just an overall briefing and it is recorded. So you can share it with others as well. And uh, please invite others and just let us know who they are. Kaylee, do you wanna say some last words? Thank you all so much for being here and for being willing to give public comment. And thank you to Nick and Don for sharing your experience in doing this. And hopefully we can get some strong rules. So thank you all. Yes. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Blessings.